Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Ann Mosley. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of serving as a vice president at the Aspen Institute and the founding executive director of Ascend at the Aspen Institute. And I am also a morning person. So I am super <laughs> jazzed to be with my tribe. And this is morning people who are about creating opportunities for children and families and absolutely see no matter what, the glass is half full, we are moving forward. You came this morning to talk about the inequality puzzle, which is a real challenge in this country. Um, but doing it from a perspective of putting children and families at the center, thinking about justice, thinking about equality, and thinking about practical solutions that are making a difference on the ground in communities across the country, and as Jackie and I were saying, actually across the globe. Um, so we are going to jump in because we want to spend about a half hour or so hearing from three phenomenal leaders who are going to bring this work to life. And then we'd love to engage in some Q&A and conversation with all of you. Time's going to zoom by, which is great. Um, but there will be lots of other conversations to follow. Before I do introductions up here, there's some special folks in the audience. Well, Ascend is a policy program of the Aspen Institute. We got created here sort of 2010, 2011 um, with a simple idea. And if you think about the opening session, how many of you were at the opening session with um, uh, uh, Mr. Dunst and the IDO and, and Dan Porterfield talking about what are the big ideas? Well, when Ascend came to the Aspen Institute, our big idea is what would it look like for the American dream in the 21st century to pass from this generation to the next. We've all seen the phenomenal research by Raj Chetty. He'll be speaking later today, talking about for the first time, really it's looking both from him and others, that it's looking not so bright for the next generation, that it doesn't look like it's going to be better than their parents. We're here to bust that cycle and create an intergenerational cycle of opportunity, thinking about serving children and parents and the adults in their lives together. Early learning, economic assets, post-secondary achievement, health and well-being, and robust social capital working to get together to, make, to help families reach their full potential and, um, and move forward both for our country and for their own potential and their own sake. We cannot leave any of this talent on the sidelines. Ascend works in three ways. We do strategic communi um, communications and convenings across the country. Um, did a lot of work um, on early learning, early childhood and health, rethinking higher ed through the lens of children and families. Um, we do have a national network of about 250 organizations touching about 4 million children and families across the country, all sectors of society making a difference. Some partners are here in the room, so raise your hand if you're part of the Ascend Network. I think we've got some folks here in the room. Yeah. Okay, they're not morning people. We're going to talk to them about that. <laughs> so luckily, you all will be joining. Um, but we also run a national fellowship program looking at leaders who are sitting on big ideas, ready to go the quantum leap forward. Um, and that can be everything from grassroots social innovation um, organizations that have big ideas that can scale, leaders of health and human services that are sitting on billions of dollars that can be better used and connected to communities. Um, as well as then looking at how do we create a portfolio of solutions that can really make a difference in the lives of children and families. We have three principles that guide our work. We think about racial equity when we think about the disparities out there in the world where right now it's about we want all children to thrive, but the disparities out there are real. We really think about that through the data and the solutions. Two, we think about a gender lens. We think about mothers, fathers, whole family. What's different for different family structures and how does it really meet families not only where they are, but where they dream to go. And then the third piece is listening to the authentic experiences and expertise of families. So we're proud to say we're one of the first programs, and I see um, with the Resnick Stubbs uh, team, we've been able to bring partners and um, parents and families actually to the campus here to be part of our conversations, to be part of the solutions, and to check us when we're a little bit off track. So that's a little bit about who Ascend is. Um, and we have had some great partners along the way. And I want to give a shout out to Merle Chambers, who is one of our founding philanthropic angels. Merle is a leader here in Colorado, one of the um, very few um, former executive, women executives of an oil and gas company. She is a pioneer in corporate sector as well as in feminism and many other areas. But leaders like Merle and her colleague Letty Bass, who have both mentored me personally along the way, but also have been willing to make big bets, put a million dollars down when idea is just becoming a reality. And I think in today's world, everybody's got their different cadence for risk and opportunity. But for wherever you are in this room, how you choose to get involved, I just were thrilled to have you here, Merle. Thank you. So moving along to that, um, another great angel and angels. 
um, I want to introduce Jackie Bezos, who is the um, co-founder and president of the Bezos Family Foundation. That's probably the title you use least. Um, usually, she can be Captain Chaos. She is really, <laughs> along with her partner, Mike Bezos, who are both, you know, they sort of take turns on who's on the stage at different times or who's doing the slides. Um, but they have been incredible partners to Ascend and so many people, and especially the Aspen Institute, to think about how do we actually create an early learning culture, nation, globe? They also have democratized and raised up how do we all have access to brain science and think about it in different ways, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and not only do they think about transformational um, philanthropy, I actually have been thinking how you are about re relational philanthropy. When they came to us to partner with us and made a big bet on us end, they said, we're not going to be your grantor, we're your partner. And so I just really want to say a special thank you to Mike and Jackie, and also my fellow morning people, Celinda Lake. Not quite the morning person yet, so I'm a bit too chipper for her. I'm, right now, I'm killing her. I'm killing her. This might be my last time she's coming. That energy force is great. I wish you are not morning people, but we care, right? <laughs> So great. Um, so Linda has been a longtime um, partner, friend, and colleague. And she is, as many of you know, one of the leading researchers and pollsters as the founder and president of Lake Research. So Linda and I go back quite a ways when we worked with a bipartisan multiracial team, the first model of its type to actually listen to women's voices back in the 80s that actually put the term the gender gap on the map. So Linda has been there for women. Um, Children, families uh, facing adverse conditions, low incomes, every kind of progressive way you can think about it. But also as a Montana um, resident and leader, she's always with a practical eye and a flair for kind of keeping things very real and creative and interesting. So thank you, thank Celinda, you. for being our partner. And then the fabulous Marjorie Sims, who's the managing director. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Marjorie Sims, who's the managing director of Ascend at the Aspen Institute. Uh, Marjorie has about 20 years of economic justice work, working also with the human rights of women and girls and families, um, both internationally and locally, and has worked in policy program um, and in philanthropy, and is actually doing some of the most cutting edge work, um, rethinking how do we collect outcomes and make al evaluation a real tool for continuous improvement. She's done stellar work on that, so it's my pleasure to introduce Marjorie Sims. Thank you. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't just give a shout out to Sarah Haight, who's the Assistant Director for Network and Outreach at the um, Ascend at the Aspen Institute, who's been doing outstanding work on driving the field, especially in the area of early childhood and health. Um, but she has actually been the driver of our national network, and so thank you, Sarah. OK, no further ado, um, inequality puzzle. We've got challenges. We have opportunities. We're going to talk first about what is the most exciting trend or innovation that um, you see out there. And I may I start with you, Jackie. Okay. We were so amazed at the foundation um, about 15 years ago, I guess, uh, how important the first few years of life. We, we've got children of our own, three and 11 grandchildren. So we've kind of had a Petri dish in our backyard for years. But seeing the science, actually seeing the science, and I do mean seeing it, because now we can look in real time inside a child's brain we can see what areas are lighting up and when. Um, we can now also put the parent in a machine across from the, a scanning machine across from the child, and we can watch that adult child interaction and what's happening in the brain. And this is totally non -inv in, uh, invasive. It is um, a machine called a magnetoencephalography machine. That's 26 letters. And you have to say it very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> so I have um, taken to calling it a Meg, and everybody else is calling it a Meg now, too. Um, it's, a, it's a miracle machine, because now we don't have to debate that a child is actually learning from birth. We know. We can see it. Um, when we were faced with this knowledge, what are we going to do with it, right? Now we know it. Now we can't unknow it. What are we going to do? And that led us to try to be super life and creative with the brain science. It was all you know, coming out, but it was coming out in a language that nobody understood, first of all. So we translated it to fifth grade read, reading level so that everybody could understand what was happening. Um, it was coming out, but never getting beyond um, a, a journal, a scientific journal that then became a, a piece of art on the shelf. And it turned into shelf science, where most of the world didn't get to see it. So that didn't work. 
So we found, I think, 12 to 15 scientists that wanted to work with us to try to put this knowledge into the hands of people that stood to gain the most, those um, parents and caregivers, but mostly the parents who would never come close to the science. So they 12, these 12 to 15 scientists signed on and said, you know, we'll give you anything you want, we'll show you everything we've discovered, and it, it's yours for the taking. So we had their science, and, uh, but it wasn't, you know, like I said, it wasn't anything that we could actually send out to anybody. We couldn't even understand it ourselves. So we went to um, an ad firm in New York City. Well, first of all, we went to IDEO. Everybody goes to IDEO first. <laughs> so we had them um, do a cross-country tour to find out what parents already knew, what they wanted to know, and did they know they could make a difference in their children's lives? And these are parents that they themselves were not parented in a way that they got the most use out of um, their connecting synapses. And by the way, did you know that you're born with a trillion synapses waiting to be connected at one million per second? So you don't hear the word trillion except the national debt. That's the only time <laughs> you hear that, right? And, and I think it's not just one trillion, I think it's a hundred trillion. It's something outrageous, but it doesn't, these don't connect except through uh, human interaction. So that's something, you know, that we didn't know either. So we, we took this information that we got to an ad firm after IDEO did their work, and they said everybody loves their children, everybody wants to know the science, some people think we've been holding out on them. Um, we go to the ad firm, we look like, you know, Lawyers with discovery, everybody was wheeling something that had to do with, you know, carrying papers. The papers were like this on their desk, and they, with, the, you know, a little bit of terror in their voices, they say, well, we don't do social, you know, work. And, you know, we, I can get a, you know, a Pepsi executive to drink Coke, but I don't know what to do with your science. Pretty soon they caught on, and Vroom was born. And so you probably have something on your chairs um, that looks like this. There are a thousand unique tips about what to do with your child during different periods of brain development between birth and the age of five. You don't need any money to do this. You don't need any more time than the time you have. We're looking for routines that you have to do that you can in invite your child to be part of. And so that, you know, that's how this was born. It's now um, being used by 900,000 families across the U.S. and in um, the Syrian refugee camps, in Lebanon and Jordan, in Tel Aviv, in uh, Africa, in, it's been translated into Hindi, and it's being used in um, India. And I want you to know all of these clever ideas that all these people are doing to be able to use this in their own capacities and their own outreach, we had nothing to do with. They're really smart. We're widget makers. They are really smart. So I invite you to take a peek at this, and uh, we'll talk more about it later. Thank you so much, Jackie. It's incredibly exciting what you've been doing. Um, so, Celinda, one thing that I just wanted to highlight, and before you sort of talk about what you're seeing and hearing from both out there um, in the public, Celinda came on board right when Ascend at the Aspen Institute was being created, and we did two things when we got started. One was we partnered with Child Trends to do an update of collecting all the data and looking it through a lens of income, gender, race and ethnicity, different um, conditions that were um, influencing and touching families' lives so we could have the whole picture with the numbers. But then even more importantly, we went to get the voice. And Celinda was our next go-to where we did a series of focus groups um, with parents and families, all sort of up to 200% of the federal poverty level across race and ethnicity, to talk to them about the world through their eyes, the solutions, the stumbles, the opportunities. And we've continued to do that throughout, as well as she's working across the field with candidates and other organizations. But I really wanted to honor that work um, because Celinda has been one of the folks, I think, out there in this polling world that is really connected to people and the politics, and sometimes I think you shouldn't be on the sidelines, you should be running, because you can merge that all together quite well. Um, but with that said, Celinda, what are you seeing? What are some of the exciting trends? What is the landscape looking like through your eyes? Well, thank you. And I, I really want to credit Anne, too, because of the commitment to not impose something on people, but to hear. And we heard both from parents and parents of all kinds, great diversity, and also uh, the children themselves. 
um, and children of all ages, which was really, really powerful. So there are a couple of things, I think, and I can't help um, because of the other hat I wear by being influenced by the fact that we're five months out from an election. Uh, and so I think about what's important here in terms of themes for some of those elected officials. So we found very, very strong support for state and federal programs. This wasn't just an effort that people thought should be private. They thought there was a public component here as well, a partnership as well. And people love the two-generational approach. If anything, they wanted to expand it to three generations because of the role that grandparents now are increasingly playing in uh, children's lives as well. And they love the idea of focusing on economic and educational opportunities for both children and parents. And that was true for outside voters. It was true also for the parents themselves who said, you know, this is very motivating for me to do homework together with my kids, and very motivating for the kids as well, who talked about, in fact, uh, the difference that um, uh, it made. And one really powerful uh, teenage girl talked about the fact that her mom now is doing homework with her younger sister, and how that would have been so motivating for herself had she seen that when she was uh, at the same age. In this incredibly divided period that we have, um, it's amazing to see the bipartisanship of this approach. Uh, so 91% of Democrats and 62% of Trump voters um, agree on the two-generational approach uh, and a government role in the two-generational uh, approach. Um, it also is um, independents are wildly in favor of it, and frankly, every demographic, male, female, uh, rural voters, 74% in favor of it. White, non-college educated voters, 72% in favor of it. Across the board, uh, this is an idea that can really unite America. One of the things that people are looking for is solutions. Uh, often, you know, frankly, as, um, as advocates, um, we tend to focus on the problem. And people have a lot of problems of their own, and they're not looking to take on yours. Uh, so uh, sometimes I think our messaging is like we're selling a chair on the Titanic. Uh, and people don't want to buy deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, this is the thing about morning people. They're very optimistic. Uh, it's us evening people that tend to be dour. Uh, but people like the fact that this is solution-oriented. People like the fact that it was positive rather than negative. Um, women love the idea that it was two for one because we're the ones that are always doing two for one, right? We do the <laughs> coupons at the grocery store for the computers in the classroom. We're always looking for two for one. And women in particular loved that this was two for one. Um, people also, uh, this isn't just a transactional kind of thing. It isn't like, uh, and I was struck, Jackie, by your point, this isn't like we're selling Pepsi and those advertising people were right. This is really actually values oriented for people. And uh, sometimes we jump right into the program uh, without establishing the values. So two values that emerged that were really top with people. If you want to make sure low income children are successful in early learning, then you have to invest in their parents' economic well-being. 76% of Americans agreed with that. 60% of Americans agreed with that strongly. Uh, this is a core value. It was true across every demographic, every political group. And the other thing that was very, very important is um, people believe strongly that Americans ought to earn a wage that allows us to sustain a family. And not just uh, make ends meet, but actually sustain a family. There's something bigger here that people are yearning for. And this combination of two-generational approach was good in the economic realm and good in the education realm as well. The last thing I will say is that um, right now people are most interested, not in opportunity actually, they're most interested in economic security and stability. And this was a policy and an approach that people thought was an incredible combination of being able to seek the American dream, but also finally establish some stability in families because they thought that lower income families, single moms, uh, that many young families now are particularly marked with instability. And the number one value for people, actually for families right now, is stability, particularly for women. So there's a lot going on here. And uh, th the good news is this uh, program and approach wildly, wildly received positively by the public.
Thank you, Celinda. Um, Marjorie, perhaps you can sort of give folks a sense of what it looks like when it's happening on the ground, as well as some, you know, where you see the innovations and trends, but also maybe mention the states leading the way. That you just mentioned? Okay. <laughs> so thanks, Anne. Um, one of the things that I think is really important, it really complements what Jackie and Celinda said, is that both programs and policies are switching in a way that they're really listening to the voices of families and how you engage with the family in an authentic way to make certain that the design of both the program and the policy really reflects where they are and what their needs are. So um, a principle, a core principle of doing two-generation work is making certain that you are engaging the voices of families. And I want to recognize Bill Resnick and Michael Stubbs for their support of the Ascend program specifically for that. So thank you for your support because it does take resources. And the secret sauce of doing two-generation, we say, is social capital. There are five core components of doing two-generation. So it's early uh, care and education, early childhood development, uh, post-secondary attainment for the adult, health and well-being, economic assets, and then social capital is truly the secret sauce. And social capital means allowing families to build their own informal and formal networks to build programs in their uh, a society within their own community. So Linda has partnered with Ascend over the last several years, as she mentioned, to do focus groups with families. And what we found is that those families feel very isolated in their communities, right? They don't trust their neighbor to babysit their kid. Mm -hmm. So how do programs that are there in community help these families build that social capital. And it can be very simple, simple in a way in which they're providing the space in their community center for these families to come together once a week with a meal, with childcare, so that they can share information about where their jobs are in their community, where's childcare in their community, and how do you navigate some of these public systems. So building that social capital is the real important component and making certain that you're listening to the voices of families. One of the things that is also really important that we see in communities is making certain that you're reflecting the diversity of families. Families determine for themselves what the makeup of the family is, right? It could be an older sibling taking care of younger you know, siblings. <coughs> it could be a grandparent taking care of you know, their grandchildren. So those family mm -hmm. dynamics and dimensions are very different in communities. And also, they're very diverse across this country. All low-income families don't have a face like mine, right? They may be in Maine, largely white communities. They may be native communities. So making certain that we're looking for the diversity in families, giving them really the authentic voice in the design of programs. And mentioned the, um, the program that's on your uh, chair, which is States Leading the Way, which is a publication that we just did looking at how across the country states really are designing solutions, as Celinda mentioned, you know, in a variety of different ways. How are uh, child support programs changing? How are um, programs that are focused on making certain that, you know, SNAP benefits really are, you know, engaged in a way that they're supporting the entire family? How are you making certain that child care programs are designed in a way that it's really benefiting both the child, but also providing opportunities for the adult for parenting? So those are some of the innovations that are happening across. But the one message that I would, you know, just really leave with you is when you're thinking about programs and policies, making certain that the voices of families really are authentically engaged in a way. Thank you so much, Marjorie. Awesome. So um, we talked about um, in the title of this, the inequality puzzle um, sort of leading uh, forward through 2020. And we are kind of very results driven over the past seven years. We've had the pleasure of attending many graduations of parents and their children. We've seen sea change in policies. We've seen fields like post-secondary, which I don't know how many of you know that one in four students in higher ed right now are parents as well as students. 
and at community college campuses, it can be as high as anywhere from 60 to 70 percent. And just how things are changing. So there's a, lot, a piece about how we're also updating our mindsets and our strategies um, to reflect all the kind of good work you've heard here. And um, so when we think about the states leading the way, looking how it relates to, we always talk about Governor Haslam down in Tennessee, Candy Apple Red, to Governor Hickenlooper here in Colorado, that have been working together as a cohort of states to really rethink their approach to children and families from a solution strategy, but also has you know, families at the table with all of the other partners and players and power brokers. And that's kind of a sea change, which is exciting. So when we think about 2020 and what this can look like, we have a robust economy right now. I mean, this is, um, we've had record corporate profits. We've had, a, you know, the economic growth continues to grow, a really significant tax break. And so very much on our mind is how do we invest this really wisely? As well as just the upcoming in the fall, we have 36 governors running for election, three governors um, in territories, including Puerto Rico, um, which we have gone down, and they are a partner with us as well. Um, you know, so I'm curious for you three, if you had you know, two minutes with either a CEO or a governor, what might be some of, um, what, how would you sort of um, talk with her or him um, about their leadership strategy for children and families and how this work um, is part of a, helping them solve a problem and lead the right way. So why don't I start with you, Celinda? Uh, well, I would say uh, a couple of things. I would say that um, this is a great entree point that so many of the problems that states face right now seem intractable to people. Mm -hmm. And particularly with the uh, adversarial relationship between a lot of states and the federal government. And so what I would say is this is a program that people think their states can lead in. Uh, they believe you, it, it would be great if the federal government were a partner, but that a state can be a leader in. <coughs> this is a great way to talk about the future. This is a great way to link the economy and education, which tend to be the top two issues that most governors are actually facing and that people want answers. Um, frankly, I would say this is a great way to target women voters. And it will be women voters who will decide the elections, particularly independent women, in uh, November. And I would say, as I mentioned already, that this is a great way to be innovative, pragmatic, and values-oriented. Uh, that talking about family and two-generational approach uh, covers all three of those bases, uh, which uh, is a winning formula for any candidate right now. Thanks, Linda. Jackie, how about you? So we, we at the foundation try to help others as well as ourselves look at what our assets are and assets are not always money it can be other things especially when you're talking about building community so if you if you're a, a bodega owner one of your assets is the the storefront window that's what you where you can reach parents with knowledge about the importance of early life um, if you're a, a pharmacist and these things have happened so i'm just kind of trying to pull them out you can, and people come to you not just for filling prescriptions, but they really come to you for health care because they don't have any place else to go. So in Milwaukee the other day, I was surprised to see two pharmacists wearing Vroom T-shirts <laughs> behind the cash wow. register. And they, were, they had put up, <laughs> people are so creative, a flat screen television set, and they were looping, you know, children being... Uh, the, and addressed it as to their needs in the early years of life. Um, so I, I think that asking people in communities to figure out how they play a part in this two-gen um, sphere, I, I think that when we look at the support that parents need in raising their young, uh, we're falling short because we're not all playing. And there's, there's a space for all of us to play. As far as CEOs, I'm going to, this is a mother bragging a, a little bit here. Um, and you'll forgive me, I hope. But um, Amazon had purchased some real estate, um, five contiguous pieces of lots that um, they were going to build on down in the um, downtown Seattle. On one of the lots was an old travel lodge motel that had been turned into a shelter for mothers with small children. It's called Mary's Place. And um, so as it got closer to build on this lot where Mary's Place was, people started saying, well, what are we going to do with Mary's Place? How are we going to, we, 
what are we going to do with the women and the children at Mary's place? So Jeff finally said, um, we have to take Mary's place, this travel lodge, down to be able to build. But I think that what we should do is give Mary's place the first six floors of one of our new buildings. And so they will live in an Amazon building. They will have mm -hmm. all of the mentors they need with all the people on campus. The, their children will have uncles and aunts. They'll have 3,000 dogs to choose from on any given day <laughs> because <laughs> it is not a dog-free zone. <laughs> um, so I, I would say that look at your assets. Figure out what it is that uniquely, possibly, you can bring to the table. If you're a bus driver, three steps that it takes those children and that mother to get on that bus gives you time to say, wow, you're building a brain today. Thank you. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can sort of I'll pull your thread a little bit more, I think one of the, on the assets piece, and I love that frame, Jackie, you know, sometimes, and there's been a lot of discussion about narrative and stories, and a lot of the stories are really powerful assets. Yes. And when we met, you gave the gift of sharing your story yeah. and, and just the two generation experience you had. And so um, just we welcome all bragging on all children, all families, it's all good here. As a <laughs> high school graduate, just, just a high school who just, um, high school just graduated last week, I'm still in the glow. Um, but uh, I do, I think also thinking about Jeff Bezos, this is out in the public sphere, he is tweeting about his new ideas for big philanthropy as well as their next big headquarters, which I'm lobbying for Columbus, Ohio. But I feel I for he- I told him that. Excellent, thank you. And my daughter's gonna run there early learning strategy. It's like all set. We've got it set. And she's going to work on the legislature. Done. Right. Check. So t feel free to tweet that out. Um, but the other piece is he is asking for tweets. He's talking about his new idea coming out. And, the, and the, the, the Mary's program has been amazing and going from the ground up. So feel free to say, to Jen, go forward. Um, 2020. 2020. Okay. Marjorie. Well, I think, you know, really building on what you all have said about the assets, and that is that family voice is an asset, it and is. how you engage families, and all elected officials and candidates should be doing that in a real way. We have said for years that you need to meet families where they are, and two weeks ago on one of our panels, a parent said, meet families where they dream. Right? Mm -hmm. Meet families where they dream. And that is so powerful because it puts them as an asset because they know what their aspirations are, where the hurdles are, and where the opportunities are for them. Mm -hmm. So I think just meeting families where they dream. Awesome. Thank you, Marjorie. So we have an amazing group of folks here. I'm going to, instead of just um, keep asking questions, which I'm happy to do, or get the conversation going, I'd love to invite, if there's a comment or a question from the morning and the evening energy people. <laughs> um, and if you don't mind introducing yourself um, as well as your question, that'd be great. <laughs> and, and, and there'll be a, one sec, the mic. There you go. Hi there. Hello. Hello. Good okay. morning. Hi, Darren Moran with The Wonderful Company. Um, Celinda, so you said something that really surprised me, which is that people are a lot more concerned with economic security than economic opportunity, yeah. which is shocking given this economy. Yeah. Um, what do you, uh, and this is a question for all three of you, uh, the idea of universal basic income, is that something that you know, we should start thinking about more seriously? Is that something you think can help get us to that basic security level so that opportunity can flow from there? So that is a really, really good question. Um, and uh, it's interesting because it's kind of the opposite of 2Gen. So when we went in to talk about 2Gen, it immediately resonated with people. It met them where they are. We have done quite a bit of work on universal basic income. And I would say honestly, well, I think it's a, a great idea. I'm totally in support of it. We've got work to do to figure out how to talk to the public about oh, it. Um, they're not very supportive right, of it. Right. And the biggest thing is, and the biggest analogy I would make is, two-generation approach to poverty and education was totally values-oriented in people's minds. It reinforced family. It took destigmatized single moms and built them up. It, I love that language of meet families where they dream. Um, and it was optimistic. Universal basic income struck people, and I'd love to talk more with you about it, struck people as pessimistic to begin with. Okay, so I'm never going to be able to make it, mm -hmm. so you have to put me on welfare. And it also uh, seemed to real people to disaggregate earning or income and work. Mm -hmm. And work is the Central American value here. Right. Um, so 
it, it it's actually a really interesting thing that you lifted up because it's almost the opposite of the way that two gen is approached by the mm -hmm. public. So we got a lot of work to do. I think it's a fabulous policy, but we got to figure it out. Yeah. And can I just add a little bit? I was um, participating in some focus groups with human services agency, you know, personnel. They were really against universal basic oh, wow. income because they felt that you know families would squander the money, oh, essentially. Geez. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Captain. <laughs> First of all, I'll just I think leave. he is a colonel, not a captain. No, I'll leave the intro just as that. Uh, so my question is about narrative. And you are besides captain? What's that? Your name? Uh, David Esselman. Nice to meet you. Thank you. So uh, the question about narrative. So I think all this stuff is really important. Actually, uh, I've already suggested room to my sister who has a young baby and why that's important. Yay. But I think the challenge that I see is that we oftentimes in politics have this narrative around dual income working poor or single moms, et cetera, as not being the assets that they are to our community. They're growing our next generation. Oh, They're the people that are actually working. But we still talk about welfare queens, the infestation of mm -hmm. immigrants. So how do we take this narrative and, ch and change it so that this is more asset driven? so that we were talking about this, not just from the data standpoint or the brain science, yeah. but actually making these people feel like they're valued uh, in this midterm election in the political debate. Yeah, good question. That's a great question. Do we like to speak, do you want to start? Uh, well, first of all, let me say exclamation point, exclamation point. Um, so one of the things about education is Americans are, are tremendous, opt I mean, there, there is the tension on the ec education reform movement, and that's a whole other meeting, but uh, in general, Americans are great optimists about the power of education, and they see education as the great equalizer. They see education as the way to obtain stability, security, and opportunity. So this entree point in the two-generational approach of um, education is very, very powerful to people. The second thing is there are a lot of the policies that just seem incredibly pragmatic to people, and that's really part of the secret sauce. Like, when people hear, for example, why not get uh, the mental health exam at the same time as the physical exam? Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, why not? And uh, it's more cost effective. And why not? And it's really interesting because Democrats like the policies because they help people. Republicans like the policies because they're, quote, tools for success. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not like each side dislikes the others. It's, um, uh, but it's interesting how people store this under two very values-oriented frames. People love the idea of your need for childcare being part of your financial assessment. They think, yeah, isn't that there already? People hate the idea that you know you take five dollar difference and you fall completely out of a program. Why isn't it more graduated? So there's just this um, general notion of we can make it better, we can fix it. This is just pragmatic. This is innovative. That really strikes a chord about how um, the, the myth, maybe, but the narrative that Americans like to tell themselves about themselves. Uh, so it's very, very powerful in that regard as well. But your point is absolutely right. And I love the idea, and we haven't tested this in the next research, of testing yourself, you know, you and your community as assets for the community. That's really mm -hmm. powerful. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say something, Jackie? I think it's, you know, this is really something that the average Joe can get behind. It is looking at... Uh, making sure that parents are in a position to know how um, how important the first five years of life are, and um, one of the things that that I f that I think that everybody at the foundation would agree upon is that when parents have the knowledge about brain development, they are really excited to know that they can make a difference in their child's life. They become better advocates on many levels. They, they feel equal to others because now I have the knowledge. And it's what you were saying about knowledge being so critically important. Um, and this is knowledge that you can use, right? It's not shelf science. It's not any of that. It is something that's in your hand, on your device, in the windows. It's everywhere. And we've started, we launched something called Early Learning Nation not too long ago. And states and communities are coming on board to be a part of this umbrella and to share their stories, like, and Ascend is at the front, forefront of that. So one point I want to add to that question, because I think it, I would agree also it's a great question. I think um, there's the, 
the construct of how it's values driven, and there's no us, them, you're really, it's about all families, and then where does one happen to be on the economic ladder? How many buffers or supports do um, one family have versus another? I think that's a really critical starting point in the asset frame. But there's a piece that there's low hanging fruit. As you'll note on our publication, so states leading the way, practical solutions for children and families. There are concrete solutions and strategies that we know work and how to make sure that that is part of the conversation. Because I think sometimes when you have a lot of language or rhetoric, but it's not connecting to like real change that's working. Whoosh. So just like literally just taking one of the populations you mentioned, um, uh, one of our Ascend fellows is a woman, Gloria Perez. She works um, nationally, but their program, the Jeremiah program, she's spoken here at Ideas before, started in the Twin Cities. Very simple problem or complicated problems, just trying to solve. I want to make sure single mothers, a growing population, way disproportionately um, living in poverty, um, that they and their children are able to reach their full potential. Basically, within a two-month period, sometimes a one, you know, little bit less or a little bit more, it's a holistic wraparound with stable housing, coaching, the social capital that Marjorie talked about, both kind of what's uh, social capital life skills 101 to 2.0, everything from cooking, connecting, empowerment classes, high quality early learning connected to where the housing is, um, economic and job training supports where the mom wants to go. Think about how rarely, and this came up um, in some of the health discussions at Spotlight on Health, how rarely sometimes even with the best of intentions people ask that parent or that family, what are your goals? What are your dreams? Versus this is what I think you should be doing. There is concrete research, just that one question can transform the results of how that works. So just on this Jeremiah program, which is spreading across the country, they now, and it's been both, they've done you know, um, heavy duty research, McKinsey and others to look at the ROI. Within a two year frame, they have mothers graduating with an associate or bachelor degree that's on a track to success, starting wages anywhere from $18 to $25 per hour, kids entering school at or above reading, math, and other developmental pieces. It's a two-year piece. Some people say that's too expensive. I think it's the greatest investment going. But there are solutions across this country, and I think we need to make sure we get the vision and the values and people at the table, but really with also the solutions and say, how do you move them to the next level of scale? Over there. No, oh, oh no, it's the gentleman over there. Can I speak without a mic? Yes. No. no. <laughs> Here you go. He's back there in the <laughs> it's being recorded. Thank you. Uh, Michael Stubbs from Los Angeles. Um, and I, I wonder whether to sort of put uh, a face on what Dave is talking about and, and possibly to sort of um, make it granular for folks is to talk about the success of parents, the achievement of parents. And the two, like, well, I think there's a lot of focus on, oh, well, this is about a kids program, even when you call it two gen. But I'm thinking, for example, of that wonderful lady from Vegas who. Tamika. Tamika. Yeah. Tamika Henry. So, just, uh, just uh, for instance, and if you could touch on that, and if those could be some of the messages that get out, like the nice. amazing, uh, she just was th catapulted into a, another level of life. Uh, <coughs> I think that, that probably makes it more clear for folks. Well, I think you said it best, Michael, is that it catapults them into another level of life because once they realize that they have their own agency, it's really important and it really is about the mutual motivation. Everyone has heard that you know parents are likely to do for their kids what they won't do for themselves. Two generation is about making certain that the parent succeeds so that the child can succeed. And once the parent has the opportunity to, you know, share their own story in their voice, they're more likely to um, succeed even further. One of the um, most powerful things that I've heard in the last couple of years is a young woman who was participating in a program here in Colorado, in Jefferson County, actually, in a Head Start program, and they changed it to be two generation. And she said, no one has ever asked me about myself. Everyone asked me what I needed for my child, but this is the first time anyone asked me about what I needed to succeed, to help my family. And so that agency that's granted when families have their own voice 
is so powerful. And Tamika Henry, I mean, she's speaking all over the country now because she had an opportunity, you know, to speak in front of people, realizing I've got a powerful, you know, story and position and advocacy. She's helping people in her community. Yeah. But just that opportunity, that's what parents are looking for, is the opportunity. Yeah. And this has been, this has been a, the sweet spot for you as well, Jackie. Anything? Yeah, it has. Um, uh, yeah, I think that we found when we were doing the field work with IDEO that um, no one had asked, asked the parents what they wanted, what their aspirations were for their children. So when that question would come up, it would be met with a, a lot of emotion, a lot of tears shed. Um, they felt that they just didn't fit, they didn't belong. You could go to, into, and we did <clears throat> work in New York, and there was a, <coughs> excuse me, um, a scooter outside of one of the, the doors, the front doors in a, at a tenement, and it was covered with dust. It was like, you know, half an inch thick dust. And um, the mother saw the IDO um, people kind of glancing at the scooter, and she said, oh, my son loves to go outside, but we can't do that because it's too dangerous. So they, they, sh they become shut-ins because there's no other option mm -hmm. for them. And so we have to go to them. We can't, we can't miss a beat. Thank you. Go to them and connect them. So we're coming close to time. So put your hands up if you have a question. Um, and do hi. Good morning. Oh, no, I'm like the, I won't be that cheap. Um, but I'm waking up. I'm fine. You're doing better. <laughs> but if you can do your short um, question, because I'd love to get everybody's voice in. And then I'll let um, our fabulous panelists um, just do a closing comment and pick up on which area you think is kind of best so that we can just bring as much voice into the, the, um, the morning. So. Um, so you're going to get your little running in. So why don't you start over there? We've got a group over here. So just say your question concisely, please, so that we can get everybody in. And your name. Thank you. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, my name is Minyan Tolan. I'm with Amnesty International. And I really first of all want to thank you, but very quickly, you spoke a little bit to um, working with schools and, sm and small businesses. And I'd love to hear some more examples of where that was really powerfully integrated, where they became partners in this process. Great. Fantastic. And there was someone back there. Keep your. Yeah, hi, my name is Prerak. Uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. My question is that how do we change the narrative that it's more about unlocking the potential of the people rather than us coming from a pedestal okay. and trying to solve the problem? You got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Leslie? Leslie? Leslie Poole. And so my question is about identifying the next the families who are not on the extreme end of the continuum, but the family who has received some service and has made, um, improved their lives, but maybe could use some more. So how are you doing, how are you identifying that group of families who are not on the extreme end, but not moving, have moved as far as they could? Fantastic, anybody else on this side? All right, good, if you can get up to, Car to Jack and Carlos. Uh, Jack Lowe. Uh, I love these anecdotal stories of success, but uh, I would like to see some statistical uh, studies of what the impact of Varum is on, uh, you know, their economic life and yep. their lack of uh, suicide and whatever right. yep. uh, the outcomes are. Great. I agree with you completely. Hi, my name is Carlos Mark Vera with Pay Your Interns. I wanted to ask really quickly about um, talking about the two-generation approach from immigrants. I come from Colombia. A lot of my friends come from families that they were farmers. They only went up to third grade. Uh, so we talk about you know meeting where families are dreaming, but yeah. for a lot of folks, they don't see for their children like college as a possibility or for themselves. So how can we change that narrative without kind of forcing an idea on them? Awesome. Okay. Anything else over on this fabulous side of the room? As well? Okay, so we're going to have um, basically 90-second responses, just because I want to be uh, um, respectful to the ideas crew here. And like lots of other, this is meant to sort of spark the rest of the day and, and create some more conversations. But we had business and schools connecting. We had get off the pedestal, really connect with families. What about some families that are a little bit higher up on the economic ladder? Let's talk about results, and let's also talk about um, children and families, um, immigrant children and families. So... Um, let's start with you, Jackie, and we'll go down. Can I pick any of those? Any of those. Wow. Um, I'm going 90 to, seconds. You get Jack, I'm picking you because I think you're, you're right on. We need 
while it may look good and it might feel good and it might you know, meet a lot of, of needs, we need proof. We really mm -hmm. do. And it's not going to look, we need you to help us figure out what that, how to get that proof and what it really looks like and how to make it important to others that are in position to do much more. That's awesome. And we are building proof points. So uh, three quick points. One, unlocking the potential of people is actually really key to getting Republicans on board, too. So Democrats, mm -hmm. like, we're fine to be helpful. Uh, and there's a kind of condescending <laughs> element to that, I agree. But um, we never saw help we didn't want to give. But Republicans uh, are much, much more appealed to in independence by unlocking potential. Um, next Gen actually does look at um, the next generation. And in fact, there are a lot of policies that the people interpreted as helping that next year, not just the poorest, because of some of the solutions of two for one and combining things. And then immigrants is really, really important. And by the way, I think it would be a mistake to see the education in two gen. And you correct me, Marjorie, mm -hmm. if, if I'm wrong here. Real people don't see it as just a college degree. Yes. Real mm -hmm. people see it as maybe that eighth grade education or that skill training to get a better job or that high school diploma. Um, but there is work on immigration. I will say this, and we just finished a major project talking to families in California for the National Partnership for Children. There is such a huge overlay now, for, and I don't need to tell you this, but for immigrant families, uh, fear of deportation mm -hmm. and separation, that uh, that uh, is legitimately such a screaming need yeah. that uh, it's really hard to get underneath to have a two-generational approach. And I think we need to revisit uh, how we approach this in immigrant communities because of the dire uh, atmosphere in which we're operating. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to try to accomplish it by starting with where Anne started, and that is Ascend has a national network across the country of over 250 organizations. They're working in immigrant communities. They're working with school systems. We have, you know, a fellowship program that is doing, you know, leaders that are doing research, working in community colleagues. So the network itself is very diverse, and looking at all of these issues basically from a core set of principles that is about engaging the voices of families and making certain that their voices are driving programs and policies. We're also helping this network of nonprofits and associations evaluate their work so it's not just anecdotal. It adds up to a collective. And in fact, some of the research that's coming out now from some of the programs is so promising both on the adult yeah. side and the parent side. And CAP Tulsa is one of the programs that I would point you to that's doing some phenomenal work. But at the national level, the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation is looking at these programs to aggregate all of that data up and then really demonstrate the value of a two-generation approach. So is that 90 Str seconds? That was <laughs> great, Marjorie. And so, you know, I just think for all of this, and you're going to hear this, you know, the, when the two-generation approach when, was kind of put out there after some really deep reconnecting and research. Um, as Fred Dunn said in the opening, some big ideas are not new ideas. Yeah. This yeah. idea has been around and lived in many ways, from the settlement house movement to indigenous communities. And we have just embraced that fully. It is not about being the new shiny strategy, program, or idea. This is about a big idea that what if we all could achieve our potential and our dreams because the only thing that, you know, it's by the grace of God, by some other structural issues, that how are families allowed to be whole and healthy? And so there were some incredible, you know, conversations from Spotlight Health closing out when we think about what's happening at the border, where, um, you know, that's the ultimate anti two gen. Mm -hmm. Children and families belong together. We need the respect and the resources because we're gonna, that's how we're gonna move forward as a country. And, you know, to Marjorie's point, there is a network ready to roll in almost all 50 states that is doing this work, making a difference. So if any of you um, are interested in what might be happening in your community, feel free to check in with Marjorie, myself, or Sarah. But I also just really want to continue to thank all of you for this was obviously on your mind, what you're thinking about, the work that you're doing. I got to say a huge thank out to Jackie, the whole Bezos family and Family Foundation, and Mike. I say, Celinda, thank you very much. You. We'll look at you throughout the day. She's going to be doing a bunch more sessions. And also the fabulous Marjorie oh, Sims. Thank you. Thank you.